Chats. Hello. Hello. And welcome to Charm Chats with Kendra and Cat or Lynx and Ragdoll. We haven't used those in a long time. We really we only use them on the on the page, the yeah. Facebook page. Because like otherwise how do you know who's posting? Yeah. I mean, granted, if I'm the one liking, yeah, if you're I'm liking all, something on Facebook, I'm always the one it's... that's liking the thing because yeah. I'm always on mobile. So yeah, if if it's being if, if your post on Facebook is being liked by Charmed Chats, it's Kendra that's yeah. doing it. Yeah, because I will always flip over to my own name and like it from my own personal page. But yeah, I, I realized it while I was editing that we haven't mentioned our cat types in a while. Yes, because we have our logo with the cats on it, wherein. You are the ragdoll and I am the blue lynx. And so we sign our... Excuse you, I am the flame point ragdoll. Yes, you are the flame point ragdoll and I am the blue lynx. Yeah. And so we sign our Facebook stuff. It's really funny. It winds up being you sign Facebook stuff with ragdoll and I sign Twitter stuff with lynx. Yeah. Even though I'm the only one that posts on Twitter and you are basically well, the no. only one that comments. What about when you quote me? Well, yeah, when I quote you. But that that happens so rarely. I don't know. It I just thought it was clarification's funny. sake. It does, and I just, but I just thought it was funny that we hadn't uh, mentioned it in a while, and we're up to episode two hundred seven of Charmed Chats, which means we've been doing this for a while now. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we haven't mentioned it in a while. I thought we would have mentioned it back in episode two hundred one, but apparently we didn't. So I figured, you know, might as well mention it now before we get halfway through the season. No time like the present. Indeed. So. We're on episode 207. Yeah. They're here. They're there. No. They're They're everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. The title is They're Everywhere, which aired on November 18th, 1999. So we're getting closer, getting closer. Guys, guys, it's Y2K. Yeah, we made that already. We did that. Mm -hmm. Well, and they're going to, they're going to mention it in a future episode. Spoiler alert. (laughs) Yeah. But after the fact. Well, yeah. It's just like a passing comment, small talk between two people. So, I apologize if you hear dogs barking or people walking, but mental health reasons, I have decided to not edit as heavily as I used to. Yeah. There are now uh, slightly longer silences and pauses. Yes. Because I used to edit those down as well. Yeah, you did. I did. But I have realized that it was detrimental to my mental health to obsess so much. So, I have stopped doing that. Ah. A revelation normally achieved through very expensive therapy. Well, you know, I have realized that therapy is not the answer for me. Mm-hmm. Patting the puppy. Patting the butt. Yeah. For me, it is just... It is watching lots of... Yeah, and it's watching lots of YouTube videos ha. of other people getting their lives together. Oh, that's that's a very interesting way to live vicariously. Yeah. Yeah, I I literally spent about five hours watching somebody doing meal planning videos and, like, bento boxes Mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. And I was like, you know, if she has the time to do this, then I have the time to edit a podcast and not be so obsessive about it. Mm -hmm. And just get it done however I have to get it done to get it done. And I know that sounds horrible in the... We have gone to a bi-weekly schedule, and so now I have given myself more time to do it. <laughs> but I still wind up doing it all in, in like, a day or two. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah, who knows? We may switch back. Yeah. Especially, especially since I gave you that completely life-altering revelation of, hey, guys, the Wayback Machine. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's the other thing that I have now tried to not edit as much. Mm-hmm. Is like the popping of peas. I'll, I'll make them a little quieter if it's like insane. Uh-huh. And I still take out like the clicks because those just drive me crazy. But I realized listening to a different podcast where they basically don't edit. Like they'll take out some things if it's like, oh, you know, we, we had like mm-hmm. five minutes of silence because there was a problem or whatever. But he leaves in all the uhs and the ums and the, the coughing in the background and whatever. And I legit was listening to that podcast and cringing in a way. Which podcast is this? Uh, it's a podcast about critical role. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's called Critical Thinking. If no, because I know a ton wants of to listen to that. I listen to a lot of podcasts that they just don't edit. Yeah, and and like I'm they okay. might if if they if they need to like bleep something out, they will. Like yeah. Gilmore Guys doesn't really edit, except well, to do that. Mm-hmm. 
and to put in commercials. Yeah, like My Favorite Murder. They they don't really edit very much mm-hmm. that I'm aware of because they have ums and ahs and Greatest pauses. Greatest Generation, and... though, does edit. Yeah. But so I realized... They're also much shorter than us. Well. And they, they like, okay, so, like, we go over... Just about every anything freaking, is shorter than us, so... We go over every freaking detail of these episodes. They go over, like, just the bare bones. And Matt Myra started a Next Generation podcast, too. Mm-hmm. It's called Star Trek The Next Conversation. Nice. And they don't really edit theirs, either. But they're also, like, they go into slightly more detail, so they're slightly longer. And it's just, it's very interesting to see two podcasts about the same subject, and... Both are funny, but one of them is very heavily bit-centered. Yeah. But for me personally, I I realized that listening to this other podcast where they leave in the ums and the ahs and the coughing and the whatever, that I hate those <laughs> so much. Yeah. So I will try to take out the ums and the ahs as much as possible. I think in like episode 203, I left in a couple, but I think I did that mostly because... Like, I was saying something over mm-hmm. it, and we overlapped voices. Yeah. And if I took out the um that you said, then I would miss the things that I said. That's and then fair. the sentence wouldn't make sense. So I was like, well, that's going to have to stay, I guess. So I've been trying very hard to not edit that as much. Mm-hmm. And the flip side of that but, is developing your speech such that you don't necessarily have that many ums or ahs. Because I think you made a comment at one point that I don't do that as often. Yeah, and you I did don't a say small one much. in that previous sentence, but it was very short, very quick, and very just, hey, I need the next word right here. Yeah, and I'll probably edit it out. So there you go. It was you know, a bit in the flow of it. Oh, you've had a few of them that are in the flow of it. I've had a few of them that are in the flow of it, and I'm still able to edit them out because I'm just that good when I oh, get damn, that insane. Girl. Oh, yeah. damn. Do not underestimate my editing skills. Do you not remember the anti Sharon episode? <laughs> I could have been better about that, though. You could have. You could have talked over me a lot more. <laughs> Though I will admit that I have realized that I do double talk, mm-hmm. where you'll say something, and I didn't like the way you said it, so I'd say it again, in case I wanted the choice. You <laughs> asshole. No, no, no. But I don't always take out what you said. <laughs> Sometimes I take out what I said, because it, it sounded better when I was editing. But, like, you'll say, you know, and she said this and blah, blah, blah. And oh, yeah, you did do that a lot on the Auntie Sharon episode. Mm-hmm. I did indeed. That's how I got around it, because I was like, I was like, no, I'm going to edit it out. I'm going to edit it out. And then you would say, you would say Auntie Sharon something or other, and I'd be like, and she does this, and blah. And so, like, I would restate it so that I yeah. could take it out. That was very annoying. Mm-hmm. You're a dick. <laughs> but while editing 203, I also realized, and I love you. You're my best friend. I love you. But I also realized you do a lot of things that annoy me. Oh, yeah. I know. Like, and I'll call you out on it. But, like... While editing 203, doing the 1930s announcer voice, <laughs> I legit, as I was editing it, I know that I told you you could you could knock it off at least twice. And I actually did pull out one bit because you, you were doing it and I was like, I can't. I just can't. And I pulled it out. But I thought it was very funny that you kept doing it after I was like, okay, you can stop now. But I let you do it. <laughs> because I didn't, like, restate what you had said or whatever. Also, I was having fun. Yeah, no, I get that. But yeah. I have left in more, like, sounds of me breathing in before talking, mm-hmm. which I didn't do before. I used to take that all out. Do you usually leave in when he does the deep snore? If you can hear it. Mm-hmm. If you can't hear it, then... Because then we also talk to him. Yeah. But if you can't hear him do the snore, I'll usually take it out. No. Yeah. But I have learned that editing... Twitched, I think he knows we're talking about him. That's a thing that happens, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have noticed, like, if while we're talking, the heat is on, mm-hmm. it sucks for That's editing. because turn down the game. Yeah, because the little line between our talking, where it's silent, is yeah. perfect. But when the heat is on, that little line is never still. Yeah. There's always noise. And so I can't just be like, pop over to where there's a long beat of, of nothing and just pull it out. I can't do that when there's the heat on because we might have talked softly over it and I won't know unless I listen to it. All right. Now that we've talked about nothing for a while, why don't we actually start the episode? Yes. Let's. Let's. So we're at episode 207, as we said, They're Everywhere, which aired on November 18th, 1999. And we start off by seeing a statue of two women holding a globe made of yellow bricks. Not Lego. No. 
and a highly ornate roof. So I'm assuming it's a museum. It's a pretty safe bet. And in fact, you would be correct because we pan down to see a few people and some exhibits. Yep. There's not a whole lot of exhibits around, though. Like it, no, it it's looks, pretty empty. It looks like it, a set. Yeah. It doesn't look... It looks very much like a set that they had a big room that could be turned into like an art gallery. Yeah. You know what it looked museum, like? A museum or some other kind of like a sort of white house. Yeah. It kind of looked like they had a room that had this ornate ceiling and they're like, let's stick some stuff on the ground and make it make this into a museum. That's what it looked like. Like, we had this huge, beautiful roof. Let's use it for something. Yeah, it's probably a set from a different show that they just recycled. Yeah, who knows? Because, hey, if it's on the lot, why not use it? Exactly. It so, gets a lot of use. <laughs> oh, man. Puns are starting fast. Mm-hmm. All right. And anyway, in this supposed museum, mm-hmm. there's a dude in a generic museum tour guide sort of outfit. Yeah. He's wearing... A white button-down shirt with no collar, under a black button-down vest, under a brown suit jacket, very very layered, okay. with light tan pants. And Going he's, for those neutrals. Indeed. And he's talking to some people that are standing around. Now, he doesn't get a name, and I don't even think we see him again, but he does get a credit on IMDb. So you're going to tangent about him. Exactly. The actor is Marcelo Tubert? Tuber? I'm not sure. Probably Tuber. I'm assuming possibly Tuber because he was born in Argentina. And we're gonna bring his history to bear. (laughs) There you go. He was born in 1952 in Argentina. He has been acting since 1983 as both a physical actor as well as a voice actor. And he has done mostly single episodes of stuff. But he is still acting and has a couple of things in post-production for this year. My, that was a short tangent. Yep. It's almost like he's only been doing single episodes of stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Indeed. So, our very first line, and this is the bit that I didn't bother editing down, because Mm -hmm. our very first line is mostly exposition, just to start us out into the episode. And the tour guide says, Legends hold it buried somewhere near a rocky desert is a fable book penned by ancient mystics known as the Akashic Records. They say Akashic. I've heard it Akashic. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but... Believed to be a written account of all significant events throughout time. Powerful stuff! If someone were to get their hands on that, they could win the lottery, or at at least least get get tenure. To know the future brings, obviously, ultimate power, which is why everyone from Hera to Hitler has been looking for the records. But to find them, to find them, one needs a map. Indeed. And then the entire group walks over to an exhibit... That is a large brown stone with interesting carvings. And the tour guide continues, saying, This tablet found in the Ivory Coast last year is believed to be the very map. Although the engravings are of a lost language and so far undecipherable, even for scholars like myself. But we're close. Whoever can decipher them first will know the exact latitude and longitude of the Akashic Records. So naturally... You had to go look that shit up. I totally did. I had to see if they were a real thing. And according to the wiki, they kind of are. It is in theosophy and anthro- anthropos- anthroposophy. Anthroposophy. Sure. The Akashic Records are a compendium of thoughts, events, and emotions believed by... Theosophists. To be encoded in a non-physical plane of existence known as the etheric plane. There are anecdotal accounts, but no scientific evidence for the existence of the Akashic records. And, okay, based on the language of origin, I'm, I'm thinking this is probably pronounced Akashic. Mm-hmm. Well. Because apparently Akasha is the Sanskrit word for ether or atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Also, in the Nepali language, Akash means sky or heaven. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm thinking this is like Wendigo. Yeah. Wendigo. 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 No. Heart numbing warrior. Whatever <laughs> the fuck. Yeah. It's an interesting thing, the fact that it does kind of exist. Mm hmm. But there's no, like, actual evidence of it existing. So it's it yeah. exists in construct. Yeah, it's one of those urban legends of days of yore. Yeah. So we then see a guy 
Standing in front of the tablet, he is wearing reddish-brown pants and a black vest over a cream sweater that has gray panels on the shoulders, and he's writing something down on a notepad. And this, guys, is an actor named Dimitri Tippins Krushnik, better otherwise known, known as... as Misha Collins. Yeah, Misha Collins. The is... adorable, tiny... Oh, such a baby. Just kind of blonde Misha Collins. Yeah. Like, I don't think this is his... This isn't his first credit... But it's pretty fucking early in his acting career. Yeah, this was his third. Uh huh. Yeah. But anyway, Misha so, Collins was born in. Oh, hi, Blue. Hi, Blue. Was born in 1974 in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Misha, the name, comes from his mother's Russian ex boyfriend. Yeah. And it's been his nickname since he was a kid. So he's like, sure, why the fuck not? I'll use it as my stage name. Yep. He's got a twin brother named Sasha, I believe. Hmm. That was not on his Who's IMDb. a professor. Hmm. Well, alrighty then. Yeah. But what I thought was interesting, though, was the Misha comes from, from his mother's ex-boyfriend, but the name Collins is his great-grandmother's maiden name. That's fun. Yeah. I was like, that's really sweet. Mm-hmm. I liked that a lot. So, for anyone who's been living under a rock for the past decade, Misha plays Castiel on Supernatural. Mm -hmm. But he's been in a ton oh, of yeah. stuff. And fun other sort of tidbit, Mishka yes. means little bear. Oh. I'm pretty sure. All right. But either way, it's cute. So he's he's kind of like a little bear. It's it's adorable. All right. Um, but yeah, he started acting in 1998. Mm -hmm. This episode was his third gig. Yep. I think after this one really ridiculous financial video where he's wearing a really ill-fitting suit and trying to explain tax code. It's available on the interwebs, trust me. Okay, that I don't know. I don't know if he was doing it as himself. Probably not. You could probably find it on YouTube. But yeah, so so just after this episode of Charmed, he got to play the part of Tony in the movie Girl Interrupted. I did not know that. Neither I did I. That. I have not seen that movie in, in a very long time. Probably over a decade. Yeah. I I really think we're gonna have to watch it again just because I wanna uh -huh. see that now. Yep. I don't remember. So he then had a couple of single episodes of stuff before getting a seven episode run on twenty four. And then he got a couple of movies before going back to single episodes of stuff. And in 2008, he started on Supernatural, and everything just kind of snowballed from there. In 2014, he wrote and starred in a couple episodes of TSA America short films, yeah. which are just kind of comedic, interesting. Yeah, they were um, interesting. Examples of shit that happens at TSA. Mm -hmm. His Slightly uh, homoerotic. His co-star's wife is in one of them. Mm -hmm. They're hilarious. You need to watch them, basically. Because, you know, TSA is ridiculous, and why not show that it's fucking ridiculous? Yeah. If I can find them on YouTube, there will be a link to the videos. I think they're either on YouTube, on YouTube. or, like, Vimeo or something. Yeah, I, I will try to find them, and there will be links to them on mm -hmm. the on the website if I have found them. And if y'all follow his Snapchat, he likes to read poetry on it. How did I not know he was on Snapchat? I don't know. What is his Snapchat? Misha Snaps? Misha... Dot Snaps. Dot Snaps. Nah. Misha Dot Snaps. All right. Mm -hmm. That makes me very, very happy. Yes. He did a cute video with his kids where they went and dropped off their voting, the parents, I should say, the parents' absentee ballots. Nice. It was very sweet. But yeah. So yeah, apparently he's on Snapchat, and that's something that I didn't know until just now, so now I am not... I am You're not welcome. He doesn't him. do much, so it's not going to clog up your feed. That's all right. The, mm -hmm. I, I have learned, I follow a lot of people on Snapchat that I don't actually watch every day. Oh my God. I just watch okay, when I'm you in sent the mood. Me, you sent me that dog rates Snapchat and yes. I fell asleep to it several times yeah. this morning because it was legitimately like a 10 minute affair of puppies. Yeah. It was so I much. had to stop it and watch everything else in the feed so that I, I wouldn't like fall asleep through the rest of everything yeah oh my god yeah we rate dogs they they will sometimes just send out 10 minutes of puppies and it's it's, it's adorable great. and it's great but sometimes you're just like i can't watch all of this right now so yeah anyway back to misha his latest role was actually playing elliot ness on the february 13th episode of timeless yes yes it was yeah he did an amazing job even if he was only on screen for like two minutes spoiler alert yeah they didn't, but, they didn't really use him very much. No. But to be fair, I think that he was only on set for like a day. 
yeah. or something because busy, of, busy man. because of Supernatural. So I do find it very interesting that he worked as a carpenter to put himself through college, yep. and he built his own home plus almost all of the furniture inside it. Yep, and that's just amazing. It really is. Like I am He's envious ex- of that. <laughs> Because that's awesome. Yeah. His wife is Victoria Van Tock. She is an author, and I think she has a doctorate. I forget what in. She wrote the definitive book on how to be in a threesome. Alrighty then. Yes. That's... And hmm. they've got two kids, West and Aximander. Yeah, that's how's that for a middle name? Uh huh. Yeah. He was born in 2010, mm-hmm. and their daughter Mason Marie was born in 2012. Yeah. And they're both They've... cute as fuck. Yeah, I haven't seen I haven't seen the daughter in much. I've seen the his, son his in YouTube, YouTube videos because his, yeah. West does this thing called Cooking Fast and Fresh with West where basically they just go to the supermarket and pick out whatever he wants mm-hmm. and then make whatever he wants That's at home. Awesome. And it's yeah. nuts and it's so memeable. Yeah, I'm sure what, that, that like, someone has probably seen how much, the meme of how much, how, what was it, like how much jelly or whatever. And he how says, many, how and he many, says, so uh, many, yes, so many, so many, <laughs> it's just, it's glorious. The entire thing is glorious. I will, again, how many carrots, so many, three jars or like, I don't, it's, it's nuts. Yeah, I will, and, I will find a video. I will put links. It'll be a thing. And it's great but, because then I think the second one, they showed Mason kind of eating the stuff. Mm. She didn't really care. She's a baby. Mm. And, of course, Misha always makes an effort to eat whatever it is that West makes. And West definitely eats it. West is a bit maniacal. Well. Benevolently maniacal, I would characterize this child as. Well, already then. I think it's interesting, though, that their kids were born two days apart. Mm -hmm. Well, two days and two years. Well, yeah. But, like, I want to know, do they celebrate their their birthday on like the same day or do they get two parties or like these are things that my brain wants to know that i know I that know. i'm never gonna find out because i don't know this person like personally but no that's just if i had a kid who was born on you know the first and the next one was born on the third then we would do a joint party on the second you know yeah, that's that just how fair. i would do they it. might they might do that because i know when he was little his family was pretty poor and basically homeless mm-hmm and one year, this random woman just, like, paid for their presents. Like, just... That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And he, he's always remembered that. So, I have a feeling he wouldn't want to be, like, excessive. Like, the man fucking built his own house. Well, yeah. And he runs an international, like, charity. Yeah. So, I can't imagine he's much into the excesses of life. Yeah. We could talk about Misha for hours, yes. and you know so much about him. So we're gonna we're gonna go back to minimalist here. We're gonna just bring it back down a I, little. I watched the scene he starred in in Nip Tuck several times. I don't watch Nip Tuck. I don't watch Nip Tuck either. You're gonna like the scene he was in though, okay. because it was kind of based off of his real life. Oh jeez! All right. I'm not gonna tell you anymore, but you're gonna have to go watch that. All right, maybe maybe there'll be a link to that on the website. Who knows? You'll mm-hmm. have to go to charmcast.com and find out. Indeed. Anyway. On Twitter, Misha refers to his followers as minions. Yep. And has repeatedly claimed that he has plans for world domination. And, you know, I think I'd be okay with a Misha world. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tumblr had the Misha apocalypse in 2012. They, they did indeed. Was that 2012 or was that 2013? I forget. No, it was 2013. Because I wasn't on Tumblr for April Fool's Day of 2012. Yeah, I don't remember. Basically, everyone just changed their profile, their icons, to the same picture of Misha. Yeah. And then just posted a whole bunch of his face in different memes. Yeah, it, it was, was great. Depending on who you ask, it was either great or horrifying. I'm on the former yeah. side. I so think it was glorious. It was, it was pretty fun. It was pretty awesome. And it's one of awesome. those, you had to be there things. Yeah, I'm totally. still friends with a ton of people. Because the whole thing was like, oh, if they change their icon to Misha, you know, you could be friends. So you're like you know, friend them on Tumblr or whatever. Yeah. I'm still friends with a ton of them. Yeah. I, I had just been on Tumblr for not too long before that. And mm-hmm. so I, I did not participate in Misha Apocalypse, but I do remember it fondly. Yes. It was quite nice. Fondly. So he has a minion founded charity called, which is the one I previously mentioned. Yeah. Called random acts as in random acts of kindness. Indeed. It is hailed as a first step toward said world domination. By kindness. 
So there's that. Mm -hmm. He's also the current Guinness World Record holder for organizing the world's largest international photo scavenger hunt, yep. which I have participated in. It's uh, called, so have I, technically. Mm -hmm. It's called Gishwez. Yep. Which it's is... called the greatest international scavenger hunt the world has ever seen. Yeah. It started in November of 2011. Yeah. Yep. And the mascot is always like some weird mashup of two animals. Mm. Like a couple years ago, it was the dynamite. So it was a dinosaur and a termite. That's just so perfect. And it has a cape because so it's perfect. dynamite. And nice. this past year was the slangaroo, which is a seal and a kangaroo. There was also fog rat, which is, I forget, I think it's a fox and a rat i forget wow mm -hmm. and wooster which is a wolf and a rooster see i didn't even know all of that uh-huh but again we i have t-shirts upstairs i can show you <laughs> we could talk about this forever so really instead can. i'm just i'm gonna thank you blue i'm going to put links to gishwes and to random max on the website i hope you will check them out mm. and possibly and possibly participate you, yes and definitely read the list of items that have been on previous scavenger hunts. Oh my goodness. Yes. It was, yeah. The first year I really, really participated was hilarious because one of the items was just pirate rats. No, Viking rats. It was Viking rats. And I was babysitting my friend's rats at the time. That's awesome. Uh-huh. What did we sing? Was it Eye of the Tiger? Was that yeah. what we sang? Yeah. There's been many a thing where... I did not think that I was going to participate in this, and then it became a thing that yeah. happened. Yeah, all of the items on the scavenger hunt are possible and not illegal, mm -hmm. but they are not easy. They are not easy, but they're a lot of fun. So much fun. So, so check much. it out. Yeah, absolutely. Check it out. And now we go back to the show. Yeah. So Misha, writing on his little notebook, looks up and says, oh my god, that's it. And the tour guide's like, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> And he, he apologizes, like, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt your tour. Yeah. And then and he... He leaves, and he passes a guy in a tan sweater and black jacket. And we've been given glimpses of this guy throughout the entire scene. But since we don't know who he is at this time, I'll keep my tangent to myself. And besides, we just tangented about Misha for, like, half an hour. Oh, my God. So I'll wait. At least ten minutes we did. Yeah, no, it, was, no, it was half an hour. I, I am, I am overestimating. But yes, we, yeah. we just talked about Misha for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And this, this dude he's passing in front of looks vaguely sinister, henchmany. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So, so the tour guide back. goes on with his tour, and we cut over to an exterior shot of the sign for Bay Ridge Convalescent Hospital. So, I looked it up just to see, even though I figured it was a fake place. There is a Bay Ridge Hospital in Lynn, Massachusetts. There is Bay Ridge Medical Services in Brooklyn, New York. And there is Bay Ridge Health Care Center in Annapolis, Maryland. But there is no Bay Ridge anything in California. And I'm just guessing, based off of the vigils we get in this episode, I'm pretty sure this has been used in a lot of TV shows. Because Possibly. Because it's, it's somewhere near-ish to L.A. Mm -hmm. And I may have seen it on, like, Buffy or something. Or possibly Psych. Like, the interior also looks super familiar. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. What, it doesn't really matter. It's, it just... it's just one of those those big set pieces that mm -hmm. location shooting that they can do. That looks vaguely hospital-esque and so they can get away with it. So inside, our young Misha is there. Talking to his father. We still don't know Misha's character's name. And we don't know the father's character's name yet. Mm -hmm. So, Dad is in a hospital bed wearing a blue striped button-down shirt and a gray sweater. Because it's yeah, the, a convalescent hospital, not an actual hospital. Yeah, the button-down shirt. Actually, this entire ensemble looks like the picture book for The Night Before Christmas. Okay. Like, the dude comes out and he's got that sleep weird-ass sleeping cap that everyone apparently wore in the olden days. Mm -hmm. And he's wearing, like, a striped blue, like, sleepy shirt thing. Yeah. And a sweater. Yeah. We assume so, this one is wearing pants, though. Yeah, we just don't see them because it's under a blanket. Mm -hmm. So, again, since I just tangented about Misha, and I'll be tangenting again in a moment, I'll tell you about the dad actor when we get his name later on in the episode. Yeah. 
So he's talking to his dad about the location of the Akashic Records being in his head. So now they, whoever they are, will be coming after him the way that they came after his dad. And in walks Phoebe, yeah. who's all decked out in some pink scrubs that have this nice little medical volunteer badge on them. Mm-hmm. And she's got a vase of flowers. Yeah, it was a very large vase of flowers, too. Mm-hmm. And she has a couple of different necklaces on and some fake braids and feather things in her hair. They were all the rage in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I remember wearing fake braids. Yeah. They're like these little clip-in things that are... It, it was a It was a thing. They then exchange hellos. She puts the flowers on the table and they have a little conversation about his dad before a doctor enters. So in the next few lines, we learn that Misha's character's name is Eric and this doctor is Dr. Stone. So Dr. Stone is played by Dean Norris. He was born in 1963 in South Bend, Indiana. Any relation to Chuck? I do not believe that they are related in any way. So his first acting credit on IMDb is from 1968, reminding you he was born in 63. Oh, wow. So, yeah. But that was his first acting credit, and then he stopped acting until 1985. So I'm assuming that it was probably a his parents got him into this role, they needed a kid for something, and here we have this kid, because he was like five. So, whatever. He's done a lot of single episodes of shows, as well as TV movies. Some of the shows that he has been in, are The Pretender, which is one of my absolute favorites, Nash Bridges, Jag, 24, The West Wing, CSI, just to name a few. His first big run was on the TV show Tremors <laughs> back in 2003. It only ran for one season of 13 episodes, but he was in every single one of them. So there's that. But most people will probably know him from Breaking Bad, where he played Hank Schrader, or from Under the Dome, where he played James Big Jim Rennie. I haven't seen either of these shows. I think, I think I've watched. Bad, he had a lot of shit to do about minerals. Yeah, I don't know. I watched like the first couple of episodes of Breaking Bad and just, going to be honest, couldn't really get into it. I felt no sympathy for any of the characters, could not get into it. So, yeah. Anyway, I recognized him from his gig on The Big Bang Theory last year, where he played a military dude. And he is still acting. He actually has six things in production right now, including a movie called Death Wish that also stars Bruce Willis, Vincent D'Onofrio, and Elizabeth Shue. Nice. So there you go. Back to the show. Dr. Stone asks to speak to Eric alone, so Phoebe leaves the room. And we learn that Eric's dad has been in this hospital for six weeks and that the dog is trying to pressure Eric to take Daddy somewhere else because of whatever wackadoo reasons he came something up with. Something about this not being a long-term solution. Yeah, it was something like, we can't provide long-term maintenance. It's a convalescent hospital. Yeah, like, it kind of can. That's kind of the point of a convalescent hospital. But all right, whatevs. Eric gets mad, says he's, you know, not moving his dad, and he leaves, and then the doctor blinks out of the room. So now we know he's our bad guy. Uh Uh-huh. Because we all know warlocks blink. Mm Mm-hmm. That's their thing. And in the blink of an eye, we have all the information we need about Doc. Indeed. So then we cut to the hallway, where Eric bumps into Phoebe, literally, and then he apologizes and walks away, but Phoebe has a premonition of Eric getting a needle attached to a finger stuck into his head. Mm-hmm. She calls after him and then runs after him, but he's already made it down the stairs because boys can just walk fast. I yeah. It's, it's well, like a also, long, long leg. quite tall. He really his, his main complaint about being on Supernatural is that his two co-stars are taller than him. And he's like, I'm big too! (laughs) Yeah, it's very funny. Because you'd think that he isn't that tall as compared to Jared and Jensen. But Misha is six feet tall. Yeah. But his co-stars are 6'2 and 6'4. Yeah. Back to the show. Then we get an exterior shot of the manor. And we're in Piper's bedroom. Mm -hmm. So we see her putting some kind of flower pattern dress into a bag. Mm -hmm. She's wearing a purple shirt under a slightly darker colored purple overshirt and black pants. And we can see her belly button. That's rare. It is rare. Mm -hmm. It's one of those where I was like, should we start a tally of how many times we see Piper's belly button? Because I think this is like the first. Mm -hmm. But no, we're we're not not going going to. to. No, we're not going to. But I thought about it for a moment. I really did. 
And then Prue runs in. She is wearing black pants and a bright green low-cut halter top. No bra, nipples fully on display. Uh-huh. We and, have some good nips. Yeah. And that little diamond necklace. Has somebody else been keeping count of that diamond necklace? If you have, please tweet at me at, at Cat Waterflame or at Charm Chats on Twitter. Email me, Facebook message me, something. Let me know if you've been keeping count of that little diamond necklace. Because I would love to know how many episodes she's worn it in. Mm-hmm. Just saying. So Prue tells Piper that she thinks that Jack is a warlock because she went to go get coffee and he was standing in front of her. And then she went to the newsstand and he was out there reading a magazine. So because she thinks that he blinked, she asks Piper if she knows of a warlock test. And then she takes note of the situation that's going on. Mm -hmm. There's a bag being packed. And Piper informs Prue that she's going with Dan to Tahoe for one of his friend's wedding. Yeah, so she is going to a wedding with her beau. Mm -hmm. And Prue very delicately picks up a piece of lingerie from this bag and asks Piper if it's a tennis outfit. Yeah, it was it was a cute little moment because they're having this little back and forth of like, oh, are you even going to leave the room kind of like thing. Yeah. yeah. And in in the middle of a crisis where Prue thinks she's working with a warlock. Yeah. And then of course she asks if Piper has tested Dan because Piper is naturally the warlock magnet. Indeed. Piper says that no cats have hissed at him. That he hasn't blinked and he hasn't tried to kill her or her sisters and steal their powers. Which is a key indicator. Yeah, so he's not a warlock. She is fairly fairly certain of this. Prue's like, okay, well, I'm going to go check the Book of Shadows. And, <laughs> and then, then, once again, grabs Piper's lingerie and runs out of the room. Yeah, she runs out of the room. all the way. Yeah, she runs out of the room giggling. It is just the funniest thing, because Piper's just like, ah, oh, that's, oh, all right, fine. And then the doorbell rings, and Piper's like, I'll get it. Yep. And she goes downstairs. And we cut to downstairs to her opening the door to Dan. He is wearing a blue polo style shirt with a line pattern on it. We don't see his legs at this time, so I don't know what he was wearing. I'm always assuming jeans because I think that's all we've ever seen him in. Probably. Yep. He wants to know if she'd be willing to leave early, like in an hour, and she says yes. And then Kit growls and hisses at Dan. Yeah. And Piper's face just, like, drops. Yeah, she goes into complete worry face. Though, is it just me, or did Kit look a bit CG to you? I didn't notice anything. Yeah, it was it was like they had to put the cat in in post-production. Maybe they couldn't get her to hiss on set. Possibly. Because it was very much like the cat was on green screen. It was odd. That's entirely possible. Yeah, it looked weird. But, so Dan is wondering why Kit is growling. And Piper's like, I'll see you later. And then shuts the door in his face. Yeah, she's like, gotta go now, bye. And like closes the door with very little emotion. And then walks over to the bottom of stairs and calls out to Prue like, do you find that warlock test yet? Uh-huh. And then we go to the opening credits. Finally. We go to the opening credits, and I did not need any help in figuring out what the post credit song was on the DVD. It was Falls Apart by Sugar Ray. I love Sugar Ray. Like, it was my go-to band in the 90s. They were great. They are an American rock band. They formed in 1986. The lead singer is Mark McGrath, who has now gone on to become a TV personality, as well as still being a singer. Interesting. Mm-hmm. The band gained mainstream fame with their 1997 song, Fly, which became their first hit. It and held the first song I learned to hate because of Kids Bop. Well, there is that. It held the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100 Airplay chart for a month and spent two months in the number one spot on the Hot Modern Rock Tracks chart. But the song didn't sound like anything else on the album. Fly was the only reggae fusion song on the album, and by the end of the year, even though the album was certified double platinum, critics were skeptical that they'd be anything but a one-hit wonder. Reggae fusion was really in at that time. It really, really was. It really was. Like, there was a Bob Marley resurgence or something? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think, like, the stoner culture What's the, had become a thing again. There was the the one song on the... Romeo and Juliet soundtrack that was by some, not ska band, but it was, they're listed as a one-hit wonder. I got, I can't remember what it was. I do not Like, know. it was one of those things where just this one random song was completely different from the rest of the album, mm-hmm. and 
now they constantly get fans because of that one song and they come to their concerts and they don't know anything else and apparently the band kind of hates those fans yeah i can imagine that i was having a conversation with someone on twitter the other day about kansas the band kansas oh yeah because i am a fan of kansas and most people only know two songs from kansas and most people only know one of those songs because of supernatural yeah so i remember i did dust in the wind at choir camp nice yeah dust in the wind is is my favorite kansas song it is the song that has followed me my entire life it's one of those songs that just shows up when i need to hear it and it's odd that way but yeah so, for anyone who's never heard the song Fly... Love Fool, that's it. What is it? Love me, love me, oh. say that you love me. By the Cardigans. Love Fool by mm-hmm. the Cardigans. Okay. Thank you, iTunes. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I do I do know that song, yes. Anyway, so for anyone who's never heard the song Fly, I will put a link to a YouTube video on the website. I apologize in advance for getting stuck in your head. Yeah. It is a very catchy tune. But just a cute note on that song. In 2011... Elvin and the Chipmunks covered it as a bonus track on the Target exclusive limited edition soundtrack for Chipmunks Chipwrecked, which was the third Chipmunk movie. Oh, man. The fact that there are three is just odd to me, but whatever. I'll put a YouTube link to that, too. You're welcome. I mean, because <laughs> why not? As if the squeak wool wasn't enough. Well, hey, you know, whatever. But as for Netflix... Both Soundhound and Shazam failed me. They could not figure out what they were. But it was upbeat and it didn't seem out of place. So it worked. I'm all right with it. So we start with a shot through a tree with yellow leaves that pans up to show a city shot with the Oakland Bay Bridge in the background. And then the Triangle Building is seen for a second before the shot dissolves into a closer shot of the Oakland Bay Bridge. And then there's another slightly farther out shot of, guess what? The Oakland Oakland Bay Bridge. Bridge. Before Before getting yet a different view of the the Oakland Oakland Bay Bay Bridge. Bridge. I swear, this is... Someone's got a hard on for that bridge. At least in this episode, yeah. We have now seen four shots in succession of the Oakland Bay Bridge. Oh my god. Yeah. Give it a rest already. Yeah, it's it's Burn that fucking bridge. (laughs) No, don't do that. Not literally. I mean the figurative bridge. Yeah. Literally burn the figurative bridge. There you go. Then we get a... Figuratively burn the literal bridge. Yes. Then we get the spinning overhead shot of the Triangle Building before getting a different overhead city shot, which leads us into another city shot that gives us the Triangle Building again. You know, I realized I stopped correcting you by calling it the Transamerica Pyramid. Yeah. You've, we've just realized that it's just easier to let me say Triangle Building because we talk about it so much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the Triangle Building, for anyone who hasn't been paying attention, is the Transamerica Pyramid. (laughs) It's like every movie Hollywood's been making about Egypt. A white pyramid. There you go. Indeed. Because it's not a triangle, and I'm aware of that. But in my brain... Yeah, but in my brain, it's Triangle Building, and that's just just That's how it works. That's the kind of pyramid the Egyptians wanted to make and discovered they couldn't because physics and they didn't have the correct materials, which is how you get shit like the Bent Pyramid. Because they tried to make it steeper and it was failing, so they shallowed it out. And so it's like that. Like, it's it, it's literally, it's like it changes slopes halfway up. Interesting. Hi, Blue. It's okay. It's okay. Calm. Hush, puppy. Indeed. So then we get a shot of some buildings that pan down toward the street before getting a streetcar shot. Yay! So this brings our streetcar total to four for the season and 32 for the series. Then we get another streetcar shot with the triangle building in the background. This one has the sake ad on it. And that brings our total up to five for the season and 33 for the series. And an embarrassment of riches. Mm Mm-hmm. Our final shot is of the manor that pans down through a tree. They love doing that. I don't know. But we do get a glimpse of the swan hitch for anyone who's keeping a tally of that for me. Tweet at me. Let me know. In the living room, Prue and Piper are sitting on the couch looking through the Book of Shadows, and there is a blue candle on either side of the book. One is in a candle holder with a sun on it, and the other is in a candle holder with a crescent moon on it. Ooh, very witchy. Yeah. Apparently, there is no warlock test in the Book of Shadows, but they do find a spell to hear secret thoughts, which, wouldn't you know it, needs blue candles. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 
So they decide that they will cast the spell with no personal gain, purely for protection. Because, hey, they need to know if the dudes they are boning and wanting to bone, respectively, <laughs> are warlocks or not. Yeah, they, they just need to know if the men in their lives are trying to kill them. Mm -hmm. You know. Because don't we all want to know that? I don't have that many men in my life. Neither do I. But but wouldn't it be interesting if we could hear each other's thoughts? That would be interesting. And honestly, if I were to get a wish for a superpower, it would be telepathy. I have learned for me personally, if I could have any superpower, it would be the ability to read, write, speak, and understand any language that has ever existed or will ever exist. Cool. Yeah, you do that. I'll get mine. And then you can teach me all the languages. Yeah, that works. Because I'll be able to get, like, imagery and feelings from people, but the specifics would be hazy, because I can't think in all those languages. Mm -hmm. Although that would be interesting if the telepathy works as a translator for minds. I don't think so. I didn't think it would. I don't think telepathy, if you're thinking in whatever language you know, you wouldn't be able to translate it. You would hear it in whatever language they're thinking in. Probably. It wouldn't translate. <laughs> Exactly blue. But, yeah, I've, I've thought about that a lot, that, that my, my superhero ability, if I could have one, mm -hmm. if I could pick one, would be to know every language. To be language. a living tower of Babel. Yeah, basically to, to be a Babelfish. Because I think that that's the one thing that would, like, help me in life, is if I could yeah. be a translator for everyone. Yeah, and you specified uh, living or dead languages? Yeah. It's the ability to read, write, speak, and understand any language that has ever existed or will ever exist. Nice. So even like Wait. made up gibberish languages. I can see the monkey's paw twisting that, that you can no longer understand any language that currently exists. No. No, no, it'd be funny though. Well. Like if this were a monkey's paw situation, it'd be like, oh, that has ever existed or that will ever exist. So the ones that currently exist are off limits. Yeah, that would suck. That'd be hilarious. You would understand no one in the world at this time, as long as it's a living language. Which means <laughs> you'd have fun at a Catholic Mass, because you could understand Latin because it's a dead language. But the fact that Hebrew, a dead language, was resurrected makes it a living language, you can no longer understand it. Yeah, that, that would suck. That'd be hilarious. That would suck. So you'd have to be very careful that has ever existed, currently exists, or will ever exist. Yeah. All right. There we go. I, I amend my yes. I, my need. I, I know how it goes with these genies, <laughs> especially if they're voiced by J.K. Simmons. All right. Oh, that was a Beyond Belief episode. Okay. It was hilarious. It's musical. I'm, I'm sure I've heard it, because I've heard them all. Yeah, he does the thing, because the whole point is that they're supposed to, like, have a loophole. Mm -hmm. So he gives them unlimited drinks, and he's like, but you could never drink all of it. And they're just like, ha, watch us. Yes, I, I do vaguely remember that, yeah. I remember when I started listening to Beyond Belief, I didn't like it. The first one I didn't like, and then by the second one I was like, all right, I kind of love this. I was kind of like that with Sparks Nevada. No, see, Sparks Nevada I liked right off the bat, but that's because I... I just kind of fell in love with Mark's voice. Mm -hmm. Well, both of them, but Mark well, Evan Jackson. I do love Mark Evan Jackson. Well, I, it was Mark Evan Jackson, I, I just enjoyed him, but I kind of fell in love with Mark Agliardi's voice. Yes. Where my, my brain was just like, yes, this, this is a voice that I could listen to forever and be mm -hmm. okay with it. I know his cousin. Really? Yeah, he was on the cruise. That's awesome. Uh huh. And then I saw him again at Gen Con. Nice. Nice. Anyway. Let's end this tangent. Yes. Let's get back to the episode. So. They decide they're going to cast the spell, no personal game, purely for protection, and Prue lights the two candles and then they speak the spell, which is, as flame lights shadow, as truth ends fear, open locked thoughts to my mind's willing ear. May the smoke from this candle into everywhere creep, bring innermost voices to my mind in speech. Nah. Yeah. I was rewriting that as I was listening to it the first time, and I'm like... And making it no. rhyme better? Yeah. Yeah, and like, making it more coherent? Um, yeah. Like, it, it would end in speak, not speech. Like, it, it would take some rearranging. Yeah. But, yeah, no, that just doesn't rhyme. There's no way you can... That's not even a slant rhyme. Creep and speak are a slant rhyme. Creep and speech? No. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> there, there are so many it's things that I could say. It's a slant rhyme of but, a slant rhyme. Yeah. 
Anyway, Piper then thinks something about Prue wearing her lipstick as she blows out her candle. And Prue naturally responds aloud about, hey, I'm not allowed to borrow your lipstick yep. while and she then, blows out hers. Yeah. And Piper realizes that this spell could be a dangerous thing. And then Phoebe enters Sans Pink Scrubs. She now has on a light blue long sleeve crop top with no bra and black pants with a patterned belt. Mm -hmm. And they hear her thinking about needing the Book of Shadows because Eric is in trouble. And sisters being sisters, they question her. And then Phoebe comes over and asks why the Book of Shadows is downstairs. And they explain that they're looking for a warlock test but weren't able to find one. And Phoebe does not notice that the book is open to the page about secret thoughts. Because they didn't, they didn't flip it. No, they didn't, fl they didn't flip do it. Anything. But I don't think that she was paying much attention to what no, was in the not. book, other than just the fact of, oh, the book is down here. I was about to go upstairs to look at the book. Yes, but Phoebe, because she's read the book the most out of all of them, immediately knows, oh, yeah, you just prick them. Warlocks don't bleed. But here's the thing. Didn't their first warlock, Jeremy, bleed? Mm -hmm. Didn't the, the priest's warlock brothers bleed? Didn't the warlock dude from the painting episode, 203, didn't he bleed? Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Like, legit, they were like, oh, just prick them. Warlocks don't bleed. But we have had evidence that they do mm -hmm. multiple times, including in this season. Yep. Continuity. There are no words. The real test, though, will be whether or not they keep this fact. Yeah, we will have to pay attention to that and because see. Because if they keep it for the rest of the series, I can forgive them for it. Because they didn't know until they wrote this episode that they would need to have that. So, you know, retroactively, like, you can't blame them. I guess. And it is only the three that I thought of, but still. If they had just had the two things in season one where the warlocks bled, and then they didn't have it in season two and it became a from season two on thing... I'd have been a little more forgiving, but the fact that they had it in the third episode of season two, and then, you know, mm -hmm. a few episodes later, they're like, oh yeah, warlocks don't bleed. Like, no, but, but they do. We've seen it in this season. Demonstrably, they do. Yeah. Anyway, so we'll deal with the fact that warlocks don't bleed anymore. Okay, fine. Yeah. It's going to be useful, especially for this episode. And it's going to be funny, especially for this episode. Yeah. There are a few things that happen in this episode that happen just so that they could have them happen. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. Anyway. So after, after learning this particular tidbit, Prue and Piper have this nice little telepathic conversation mm -hmm. where they're also kind of doing it with their faces because they don't know how not to. Yeah. And they're trying to figure out if they should tell Phoebe about the spell or if they should just reverse it. And, and then Phoebe breaks their train of thought and tells them about her premonition and tells them to deal with Jack and Dan while she looks on the internet. Now, here's my question. Was she going upstairs to look on the internet? No. No, she was going to look in the Book of Shadows. So why does she decide to look on the internet now instead of saying, are you done with the Book of Shadows? Can I have that now? Like, yeah, I don't know. And then Phoebe leaves and Prue and Piper have a little telepathy moment again. And then they go back to looking through the Book of Shadows before we cut to the next shot like i don't mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that happen in this in the the ending of this scene that just don't make any sense yeah who, the writer did not talk to the person who was blocking the scene or something yeah it's or maybe it was just two different writers and they forgot to correct for continuity yeah well they anyway. you know continuity in this show yeah are, <laughs> the venn diagram that is the show charmed and continuity are two circles. are two circles that do not touch Mm. Or if they do, it is the tiniest of slivers in the yeah. middle. Yeah. Because, yeah. Anyway, mm. that's that's another story for another day. Yeah. So we then go to an exterior shot of Buckland's that pans down to the sign, and we see a brown suit man walk by. Hi, our, BDSM. Hi. Our How you little, doing? Our lovely little time traveler. So we have now had a, a lovely little time jump. We are now in Prue's office, where she has added a brown leather jacket to her outfit, and there's a quick knock at the door, and then Jack enters, wearing sunglasses, shorts, a white t-shirt, and a gaudy, like, Hawaiian-type shirt with a pattern on it that looks like children's toys on shelves, and a beaded necklace and sandals. And, this is the best part, his hair is spiked up, a bit like Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray. Yeah. 
Ah, the 90s. Uh -huh. Gotta love it. She asks him about his uh, outfit. Yeah, like, you wear that to work? And then she asks about some internet auction that Jack dealt with because she wants to know who did his validation. And he pauses because he has no fucking clue what that is. Mm -hmm. So she questions him on it again. And here's his thoughts. Which are troubling really out, of out of context. context. Yeah. He thinks that he puts people in graves or incinerates them. And so she starts to back up slowly. And then and he then, verbally throws out the name of someone at Berkeley. Yeah. And then thinks right after that, if she finds out I'm lying, she's gonna die. Yeah. And then he makes some sort of excuse about being late and he leaves. And Prue goes, you're dying first. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. And then we cut to the manor via a ringing doorbell. Because that's a thing that happens a lot in this episode. The doorbell ringing. Yeah. Piper answers it, and it's Dan. Yep, he has now added a light brown jacket on top of the shirt he had on earlier, and we can now see that he is wearing jeans, just like I had mm. speculated. He asks if she's ready to go, and she tells him to come on in. He does. Piper closes the door, and we hear him thinking about her getting cold feet. Like, he does that immediate panic response, like, mm -hmm. oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Yeah, like, oh, sh she's not gonna come, she's gonna mm -hmm. back out, whatever. And so she freezes him. And then pricks his hand with a needle and, and nothing, nothing happens. happens. So she freaks out mm -hmm. just as Phoebe is running down the stairs saying something about needing to go get Eric. And she notices, notices the panic on Piper's face. And Piper's like, Phoebe, help, he's not bleeding. And, and she, she like waves her hand in front of him and she just goes, honey, he's, he's frozen. frozen. Yeah, it's like he's frozen, therefore his blood is frozen. And Piper does this like relieved giggle. That's and she's super like, adorable. It was so cute. And then she's like, okay, go back upstairs. <laughs> and so... Phoebe runs back upstairs, and Dan unfreezes, and he bleeds and yelps in pain, and she touches his hand, and he thinks sweet things about it, and then she starts to say something, and Phoebe comes back down the stairs, and we get a cute sister moment where Piper says, he's bleeding, and Phoebe replies, he's, he's lucky. lucky. And Dan looks confused. Yeah, it was great. Phoebe tells Dan that she's got to borrow Piper, and uh, then stares at his butt, thinking, nice, nice butt. butt. And Piper, Piper yells hey at her, and then realizes that because... Phoebe doesn't know the spell, she turns that into a hang in there to Dan, which was kind of funny. And then she walks Dan toward the door, trying to cover his butt with her arm so that Phoebe won't stare at mm -hmm. it. It was the funniest little moment in the episode. It was uh -huh. great. She opens the door, and Kit, who is, again, the on same some CG. sort of green screen, yeah, the CG kit. growls again, and Dan looks out and up and sees a hornet's nest. Yeah. Like, where, right outside the door? Yeah, there's, like, hornets flying around. You'd think that he would have noticed that earlier, because I noticed those things. Am I the only one who, like, looks up when I get toward a door, when there's, like, an overhang? No, you're not. Okay, good. That makes me feel better. So he sees this hornet's nest, and he's like, oh, that's probably what she was growling at. That's probably what stung me. And then as Phoebe comes up and she is adding a jacket, which is a cropped jean jacket with a leopard print collar... Mm -hmm. God, the 90s, Leopard man. Leopard print faux fur. Yes, faux fur. So Phoebe is putting on her jacket. Piper kisses Dan goodbye, tells him not to leave without her, and he leaves. And Phoebe hands Piper her jacket, which is dark blue. And she puts her coat on, and they open the door, and we hear the cat meowing again. Because why not? Yeah, so instead, so now they've opened the door, the, the hornet's nest is still there, but instead of hissing, the cat just meows this time. Meow. Yeah. I don't know, whatever. But then we get a new shot of a streetcar. And Kat is excited. I am excited because there's a new ad on this one. So our streetcar total is now up to six for the season and 34 for the series. And the ad on this streetcar is for Smirnoff, which is a vodka. The tagline is, friends are worth Smirnoff. <laughs> what? Yeah. So Smirnoff is a brand of vodka that started in Russia, but is now actually owned by a British company. They make nearly two dozen kinds of vodka, including flavors like marshmallow, whipped cream, peppermint, wild honey, cake, yep. caramel, root beer, and espresso. And tons more. Yeah. They also have nearly two dozen malt beverages, most of which are labeled either ice or twisted. And come in various fruit flavors like yeah. green apple, pomegranate, watermelon, black cherry, mandarin orange for some odd reason. They mm -hmm. could just do orange, nope. lime, wild grape, and raspberry. Yep. I will, of course, put a link to their wiki on the website. 
But yeah. Like, I don't drink, but part of me wants to try root beer vodka. We can arrange that. Just because I would like to try I, root beer vodka. I can't vodka. imagine you'll like it. No, I don't like vodka. Yeah, like, I know. As, just as a whole, I don't really care much for vodka. But if somebody had, you might like, the like, flavored vodkas, I would totally try, like, half a shot. You might like Not Your Father's Root Beer. Which is just a hard root beer? Yeah, possibly. Mm-hmm. I used to like Mike's Hard Lemonade, or not not lemonade, the Mike's Hard Iced Tea. Mm-hmm. But they had a Mike's Hard Black Cherry. Mm, yeah, that's just good. Yeah, like I don't drink, and I drank a six pack of that in like a weekend. It was Ooh, bad. Damn. It was bad. When that first came out, I was like, oh, this looks cool. And a friend of mine had it, and I had like a sip of it. And then by the next thing I knew, the bottle was empty. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then the next thing I knew, the entire package was empty, and it was all in my belly, and it was And not... then the next thing you knew, you were asleep. Yeah, no, the next thing I knew, I was home, and I'm still not sure quite how I got home. <laughs> so there's that. I'm, I'm, well... You probably I'm didn't fairly, drive. No, I'm fairly certain that somebody else drove me in my own car, and then they took, like, a taxi home, or took oh, the, the train or something. But yeah, we're gonna have I'm, to get some of this because I want to see a drunk cat. Oh no, no! I want to see buzzed cat. I can give you a buzzed. Okay, we can do that. We can do that. Because usually, what, especially in my early career of drinking, what would happen is I would start singing in French. Oh, see me, it would just be gibberish because I don't, I don't know French. But I used to make up fake French songs. Ah, no. That's how I wound up finding a playlist of songs in French. Because I just randomly started singing in mock French Hmm. the song Jar of Hearts. Oh, yeah. I just started singing that that song in, like, fake French. And then I was like, I wonder what this would actually sound like in French. And then I just went down this, like, rabbit hole of YouTube. (laughs) And I have found that the John Legend song All of Me, Mm -hmm. which was my cousin's wedding song. Oh, yeah, you showed me that. Yeah, it was my cousin's wedding song. And in French, that song is so pretty. Like, it's pretty in English, but in God, French... everything is prettier in other languages. The one time... Well, the, depends the, on the language. Uh, English is the worst of them. German. No, I... Okay. There I've are some, some songs people, in German that, that are not pretty songs, I think even that, though they have I pretty think subjects. I might be the singer, because, honestly, like, I've known people who speak German so fluidly, mm. like, and it's clearly still German... But they're just so musical about it. And I'm just like, I want to hear you do more stuff with German. Because it really depends on the person. Same with English, Maybe. too. But, yeah. like, I had to sit through an opera that was in English. And I was so uncomfortable the entire time. Because <laughs> I'm like, this sounds stupid. Musical theater mm-hmm. is a uniquely American phenomenon. And thus, it naturally evolved entirely in English. It did not exist in other languages. I had to do a paper about classical music conventions that were specific to certain languages, like Mm -hmm. rhythmic conventions that evolved from language. And when you try and translate those into English, it just sounds dumb. Well, yeah. And if you try to compose an opera in English, it sounds dumb. Yes. Most operas should be in Italian. It was called The Last Leaf. Yeah. Mm Okay. It was dumb as fuck. I I give that side eye. Yeah, Yeah. You should. Anyway. anyway, the streetcar passes by and we stay lingering on a shot of a building that is supposed to be an apartment, but there is a very small sign on the roof, on the little roof line, that says Timeshare Hotel Suites. What? Yeah. So, for anyone who doesn't know, a timeshare is a property with a particular form of ownership or use rights. It's also known as vacation ownership. It's also mostly a scam, and no one should do it. Basically, you pay for a house, but you only get to use it for a week every year. Mm -hmm. And once you pick when you want to use it, you can't change it. So if something happens and you aren't able to go when you normally would, you're out of luck and have now paid for a property that you don't get to use at all. And you don't really own anything. Yeah. So it, it's all tremendously... It's kind of like you're renting it. Yeah, it's kind of like you're renting time. it for a week, but you're paying way too much to rent it for a week. Yeah. Yeah. It's all tremendously confusing. And so, you're usually sharing it with like five other people. Oh, or sometimes or even more than that. Oh, yeah. Sometimes even and more than that. Which is why you only get that small amount of time with it. Yeah. 
and why I know everyone, a, everyone tries to schedule, like, when they're going to be there. I know someone who has a timeshare in Colorado because they wanted to go skiing in Colorado in, like, November or whatever. And they legit couldn't go for, like, three years because there wasn't snow when they were able to be in Colorado. And for, like, the week that they had the house, there was no snow on the slopes. And they're like, well, there's no point in us going if there's not going to be snow. And so they didn't bother going because they were like, well, why should we spend money to go to Colorado for a week and do nothing? You already spent it. Exactly. But that's, you know, whatever. But it it's, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's all tremendously confusing. So if you want to read up on it, I'll put a link to the wiki on the website. But yeah, if, if you ever get the opportunity to do a timeshare, say no. Say no. Say no, thank you. Say no to this. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Say say no and walk away. Mm-hmm. Fast. As fast as you can. As fast as your legs or wheels or crutches we'll or whatever will take you. Cheetah. Yes. Run as fast as your body will go. And if you cannot run, walk. And if you cannot walk, wheel. Whatever. Just get away. <laughs> Trying not to be ableist. Yeah. Anyway. So, Phoebe and Piper are walking down a hallway that has pink walls and hotel art and flowered curtains on the windows, and then a guy walks past them holding tennis gear. Yeah. It was it was just kind of funny. And so Phoebe is telling Piper that the bad guys are called collectors, and they are a warlock breed that drains knowledge out of people's brains with a weird needle finger, mm-hmm. and that there's no known way to vanquish them. Oh joy. And then they find the apartment that they're looking for. And we cut inside said apartment, and we see three people in a bit of a scuffle. One of these people is Eric, one of them is Dr. Stone, and the third guy is from the very first scene that we kept getting glimpses of. He still doesn't have a name, but we now know that he is important, so I shall tell you about the actor. Shall be a small little tangent. Mm -hmm. So, his name is Eduardo Saad. It's S-A-A-D, but I'm assuming it's Saad, because everyone I've ever known with that name pronounces it Saad. (laughs) <laughs> so Eduardo Saad, Eduardo no have pizza. <laughs> but I I don't know if his first name is pronounced Eduardo or Eduardo because I think it's, it's probably Eduardo. Yeah, I don't know. There's I an mean, extra that, that O would, in it that's yeah, but not that, usually there. That pronunciation would happen naturally as as you pronounce it quicker. Yeah, whatever. So I have a feeling it's probably Eduardo. We're, I'm just gonna call him Ed, and Ed, I hope he's okay with that. Eddie Saad. Yeah. So, he has no picture on IMDb, and he only has eight acting credits. He only acted from 1991 to 2000. Which and he's, makes an average of about one acting credit per year. Yeah. And he's really only done single episodes of shows. But he did have one role, which was three episodes of a show called Action in 1999, just before he got this episode of Charmed. Now, Action was a show that starred Jay Moore... And it only had one season of 13 episodes. The first eight episodes aired on Fox, and the remaining five aired on FX. Not Maybe that's sure why. why it only had one season. Possibly. Not sure why. But here's the funniest part about it. It was originally intended to air on HBO, starring Oliver Platt in the role instead of Jay Moore. But the people in charge wanted more money. So they tried to get HBO to give them more money, by offering the show to Fox. But it backfired on them because Fox decided to pick up the show. Hollywood is weird. Yeah. Yeah. So I only bring this up because I have to tell you that Ed's character's name on action was named Momo Shabong. <laughs> what the fuck? You're welcome. Oh no. Yeah. Momo Shabong. There's no other reason to bring up that show <laughs> other than Momo, Momo Shabong. Shabong. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, back to this show. Back in the hall, Piper and Phoebe hear the struggle happening, and we cut back into the apartment, and we see that Dr. Stone and the other guy are holding Eric down on a table, and then Stone's finger turns into a needle just as Piper and Phoebe walk in. Piper deftly freezes all three of them, mm-hmm. and at which point Phoebe's like, hey, that's Dr. Stone! Yep. And they're like, shit, we gotta get Eric out of here! Yep. So Piper unfreezes them, well, I don't know if Piper unfreezes them or they just unfreeze. I feel like she unfroze them. Yeah. Because that was way too quick for anything, like, for the expiration. Yeah. Uh, and Phoebe immediately just kicks one of them in the face. Yep. She does her lovely karate on them. And Eric, then, 
instead of immediately leaving with them, runs to a dresser and grabs a gun out of the top drawer. Yeah, that was, you know, and all that convenience. Why does he have a gun? Who knows? Whatever. And then he shoots the bad guys in their torsos. Mm -hmm. But they aren't down for long. They stand back up with holes in their stomachs. And Phoebe grabs Eric's hand. They all run. And then we see the wounds like magically just like disappear. Yeah, the the bad guy from the museum, his wound closes up first and then it starts to fade to black as we see the wound on stone close up. And then we go to commercial break. It was an interesting moment where it didn't happen at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, yeah, it was it was an interesting choice. Yeah. So, when we come back from the commercial break, we are greeted with an exterior shot of the manor. And we see that Piper, Phoebe, and Eric have walked into the kitchen. And we learn that Eric knows that those are the guys who put his father in the hospital. But I'm not sure how he knows that those are the same exact guys. But, you know, he a lot of convenience, what you going to do. He that because, you know, he told his dad, like, they're going to come after me now. And then, lo and behold, these two guys come after him. I guess. And start attacking him, and he probably just didn't see the, the needle thingy. And so he's like, oh, they're probably going to take me and, like, torture me for information or something. Yeah. 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 All convenience. Exactly. So then Piper asks Eric who he thinks those guys were. And in his head, he's like, oh, they've got to be NSA or CIA. Yeah. And he's like, they're probably people in bulletproof vests, because guess what you do when you're someone who doesn't believe in magic? You make these very logical assumptions. What was the first episode of Doc of the reboot of Doctor Who? He's like, that makes sense. Good job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and indeed, for Eric, that makes sense. Good job. Indeed. So he wants to know who they are, meaning the girls. And Phoebe says that they are friends, which makes him, because, you know, we, we can hear his thoughts... He thinks that they're after the Akashic Records, just like the bad guys. And Piper very subtly asks what the Akashic Records are. Yeah. So Phoebe actually gives us the exposition that they are a book of ancient prophecies, the future of the world down to the smallest detail hidden away and lost for centuries. And then she says that it's legend, and Eric questions how she knows about it, and she says that she reads a lot, and then questions Piper how she knows about him. And but, Piper kind of just blows her off. Yeah. And she's like, well, what if it's not a legend? And Phoebe says that that means that the bad guys would win by using the future against them, which prompts Eric to immediately think about getting his father out of the hospital. Phoebe, of course, tries to calm him down by saying that it's not about his father anymore because Eric himself is the one who has the answers now in his head. But Eric tries to be all macho with the line of, try and stop me. So Phoebe grabs his arm and flips flips him him. and he lands on his back on the floor and then she sits on top of him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Phoebe smiles and then Piper smiles and Prue enters with a great line. Entertaining Entertaining guests, I see. see. Yeah. It was cute. It was very, very funny. Eric struggles trying to get up. Phoebe asks for some help and Piper freezes Eric. So Phoebe gets off of him and then Prue asks who the cute boy is. And Phoebe fills her in about it being Eric from the hospital. And then she gets to the bit about the Akashic Records, and Piper thinks about what they are. So Prue says out loud exactly what Piper had been thinking. You know, collectors get it, the world's a goner, la la la. Phoebe is still rightfully confused, so Piper finally thinks that they need to tell her what's happening. And Prue elects to be the one to do that. She's like, yeah, we didn't know about the whole pricking thing. So we cast a little hearing thought spell to find things out. Yeah. And then Piper informs Prue that Dan's clean and Prue thinks back at Piper that Jack's not. Mm-hmm. And Phoebe's like, are you thinking about me? Yeah. And she it, looks just crestfallen. It was, yeah, it was so self-conscious and I felt bad for her. But Prue's like, no. Very dismissively, too. <laughs> yeah. She's like, uh, no. Yeah. And, and then, then asks she asks about Eric. Yeah, she asks if Eric knows about witches and warlocks, but Piper's like, no, no, he thinks it's a government conspiracy, mm-hmm. which was kind of funny. But then she asks how Prue knows that Jack's a warlock, and Prue tells her about the thoughts that she'd heard, and Phoebe asks if she'd pricked him, but Prue's like, no, that I need Piper to help freeze him first. Mm-hmm. And then Piper sees the silver dagger on the table, wrapped in a blue velvet cloth with gold stitch detailing, and asks where Prue got it. And Prue says that it's the dagger from the troubled priest with the warlock brothers, which I've mentioned before. That was episode 118. Mm-hmm. She says that they left it behind, so she kept it just in case. I'm Unfortunately. Guessing, I'm guessing 
That was, yeah, that was supposed to be the dagger that they got stabbed with? Uh Uh-huh. Unfortunately, this is a huge continuity problem, because that dagger disappeared with the warlocks. There is literally no way she should have been able to keep it. It disappeared with the dead guy. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway. Phoebe tells them to go get going, hurry back, and then goes and sits back down on top of Eric, while Prue and Piper look at each other. Prue starts to think about how they have to go kill a warlock while Phoebe gets to sit on a guy. And Phoebe sees their faces and is like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, which makes Prue wonder if she can actually hear her. But Phoebe's like, I don't need a hearing thought spell to know what you're thinking. And as Prue and Piper are leaving, Phoebe swats at Prue's ass. Yeah, it was kind of funny. And then Piper unfreezes Eric as she leaves. And Phoebe asks if he's going to behave. And he's like, do I have a choice? She says no and helps him up. And honestly, at this point, the throughout this entire episode, I was thinking, it's so clear how inexperienced Misha is with acting. Mm-hmm. A lot of his shots are completely separate from all of the shots of the girls. Like, he had to do reshoots because it wasn't going that well or something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But, but can I just say how weird, after listening to him as Castiel for so long, mm-hmm. it is so weird to not hear him talk with that deep voice. Well, I mean, if you listen, if you listen to his voice in the first episode he was in, it's much like this. Mm-hmm. It's not much lower pitched. But then trying to do the Castiel voice just naturally like drop the floor mm-hmm. out of his vocal cords. Yeah, I mean, it's very fortunate he hasn't developed nodes or anything. Yeah, but it was just very funny because I heard this voice and I was like, "Oh, he's such a baby!" And like you hear this voice and you're like, he's so "Oh, little. he's adorable." He's so- and then he grows up to be this, like, badass, and you're just like, all right, dude, mm-hmm. get it. Yep. Get it, get it. Anyway, so we then cut to an exterior shot of a building, which, according to the signage, is the Los Angeles County Historical and Art Museum. This building is now called the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, and since I don't feel like tangenting on it, I'll put a link to the wiki on the website. Though... Just reminding you, since it's been a while, that the distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles is 381 miles, or 613 kilometers, and would take about six hours to drive from one to the other. Six-hour drive between San Francisco and Los Angeles. So just remember that. They are using an external shot from something that is six hours away from where they're supposed to be. And didn't bother to edit it. Yeah. Just saying. I've actually seen this shot. Well, not this exact shot, but a slightly further back shot of this same building in the TV show Bones when they're supposed uh, to be in D.C. Ah. Uh, so that's even funnier it does, to me. It does look like some kind of courthouse. Yeah, it does look like something that would possibly be in D.C., but it was just very funny to me. It was like, oh, I know Did that shot. Did they at shot. least like, properly edit out the signage? It was a far enough away shot that if you didn't, uh, you couldn't see the signage. Cool. Yeah. But I just thought that was very funny that it's like, oh, look, there's a shot I recognize because of Charmed. (laughs) So, yeah. Anyway, so the nameless collector walks up to our Dr. Stone, who is leaning against a trash bin that has a sign on it saying, keep San Francisco beautiful. I'll just sit here quietly and shake my head. Stone asks if the other dude found Eric. Which he hasn't. No. And he's like, he is protected by a time-freezing witch. Then the other one calls Phoebe Bruce Lee's little sister, which is kind of funny. Uh And they chat for a moment, and they decide to get to Eric through his heart instead of his brain. And then Stone blinks away a moment before the other guy does. And we cut over to an exterior shot of the Buckland sign. And we get a split-second glimpse of Brown Suit Lady before Feathers and Her Hair Lady comes into frame. They're back? Yeah. Oh my god! I know. I know. Could this have been a shot from last season? I really think that all of the extra scenes that have brown suit lady, feathers in her hair lady, red umbrella lady, like all of those, were just from the first season. Like, they just reused everything if they could. That would work. Yeah. They've added in a couple of other things, which is why we now have brown suit man, which still makes me laugh that nobody recognized the fact that they used that shot in the 2009, like, future, and they're, they're using it back in 99. Like, it, it just blows my mind that nobody put that together. They don't have a continuity master. I know. I know. It's sad. So sad. Anyway, in her office, Prue is looking at some items on a table when Jack enters, and he is now wearing a dark brown shirt under a darker brown jacket with pants to match. He asks to come in and starts walking toward Prue as Piper enters. Prue, via telepathy, tells her to freeze him, and she does. 
And then Piper tells Prue to poke him in the hand with the dagger. And when she does, she sees he's not bleeding, freaks out and starts to step back. But Piper's like, oh, hun, no, no, he's frozen. He's frozen. Don't worry about it. Yeah, she remembered that little that little moment from earlier mm-hmm. in the day. And she had, Prue has another kind of little, like, relieved giggle. Yeah. And she hides the dagger, gets back into place, and just as Piper is about to unfreeze Jack, the door opens and hits her in the butt. Yep. And then another Jack enters. This one is wearing the same obnoxious outfit from earlier. This Jack does not notice that the previous Jack is not moving, and so walks up next to him. Yeah, and he's like, what's going on? And so Piper freezes the new one and wonders if they're twin warlocks, and Prue's like, or just twins? Yeah, maybe they're just twins. If the first one, she's like, if the first one doesn't bleed, they both die. Yeah, which I did think was kind of funny. So Piper unfreezes them, and we get some lovely green screen work as the Jacks talk to each other. And then Piper goes over to join Prue, and Piper notes that the brown outfit Jack is indeed bleeding. Prue asks which of the jerks is Jack, and the one in the brown outfit raises his hand with a continuity error, because now there's no blood on his hand. And he looks a little bit contrite. Yeah. And he informs them that the other one is his twin brother, Jeff. And that apparently it was their habit when they were younger to switch places so that one of them could check out whoever they were developing an interest in. Yeah. It's a thing that apparently twins do a lot, especially if they're identical. Yeah. I know for a fact that if I had had a twin, I'd probably would have done it. Oh, yeah. Like, totally. But But Prue thinks to Piper that this doesn't make sense with what was coming out of Jeff's head. Yeah. And so Piper, very... Actually, this one was fucking subtle. She's like, Jeff, what do you do for a living? Mm -hmm. And we get the the funniest line from Jack was like, oh, this will be a conversation stopper. (laughs) It was just, it was cute. It was funny. Yeah. And we learned that he owns a whole chain of mortuaries. Which explains the whole put them in graves, set them on fire thing that he was thinking about. Uh Prue then tells them that they should be ashamed of themselves. She walks up to Jack, slaps him across the face. And says, that's for thinking you could get away with it. Then Jeff laughs and Prue slaps him as well and says, that's for thinking you wouldn't get slapped. Uh Uh-huh. Piper then laughs and they exit the office, leaving Jack and Jeff alone. And Jeff ends the scene with a little, I approve and a smirk. So this is the first, last, and only time we ever see Jeff. Yeah. And so he once again, like an even bigger douche. Well, yeah, but it's like so. Once again, they bring in a character that we never hear about again. Oh well, like they don't even mention if I if my memory serves, which we both know, yeah, it doesn't. But if my memory serves, we never hear about Jeff ever again. We like, don't. Like he isn't even brought up in passing. Nope. I think that's the. the I think that really truly is the one thing about this show that annoys me. Mm-hmm. The most. Yeah. Is when they introduce a character that they never bring back in any capacity. They never even mention them in passing. Mm-hmm. And so it's it makes it slightly less real for me. Yeah. It, because it, it, in normal life, if you meet somebody, you're going to tell somebody else about that situation. Mm-hmm. You're going to be like, oh, hey, and did you know that this guy that I work with has a twin? You know? Or, like, I've met your brother. Yeah. Like, once. But you've talked about him a few times. Mm-hmm. So, like, I know a little bit about him because you've talked about him. Yeah. And I know a little bit about your brother, who I've never met. Exactly. So, I think that's my biggest annoyance. Even more than the continuity errors, and that's saying something. Mm-hmm. Is the fact that they yeah, bring it, in characters that we never hear about again. It for betrays any a lack of care with regards to world building. Mm-hmm. And attention to story detail. Mm-hmm. Especially since they bring in people and it kind of, that they could absolutely bring back, oh, yeah. or at least in mention. Like, the, the one... You don't even have to pay them for their appearance. Yeah, like, the one thing that... They that already I, have a side card. Yeah. The one thing that I always come back to is the little boy witch dude. Yeah, Max. Like, Max. Yeah, like, why don't they Aviva. ever mention him again? See, even, like, Aviva, that one doesn't bother me nearly as much. I have I have gotten past Aviva as as we have gone through this a little more. Oh, she'll be disappointed to hear that. <laughs> but like I because she got her powers through not conventional means, I don't necessarily have as big of a deal in the fact that they never mention her again. But Max is a witch. Mm-hmm. And therefore they literally could have brought him back at any point just in passing of 
you know, hey, you know, we got a we got a letter from Max. You know, he's he learned this. He's doing this. He's doing well. Postcard from Max in the mail. Like anything. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so many ways that they could have brought back in passing somebody, and instead they bring back a completely different actor to play a character that we didn't need them to bring back. That I just I have. Many thoughts. I'm going to stop. We're going to go back to the episode now. So we get an exterior shot of the manor where we get to see the street lamp. It's it's a shot we don't get to see very often. And we see Eric sitting at the cafe table when Phoebe walks up with a tray of tea and pours it into two cups. He wants to know how she knew to help him. And after some prodding, she tells him that she was born with the gift to know when trouble is going to happen. She, in turn, asks him why he translated the Codex thing and he's like, oh, I did it for my dad because people hurt him and I want justice, even, mm-hmm. even if he gets hurt in the process. Indeed. And then they drink their tea and they have a little moment talking about family and fathers. And then she decides it's time for action and they walk out of the room. And then we cut to the foyer just as Prue and Piper enter. Piper calls out, Jack's not a warlock. And Prue responds, he's a jerk. Yeah. Piper starts to take off her jacket as Phoebe and Eric enter the foyer. And Phoebe says that they've got to get Eric's dad out of the hospital. So Piper begrudgingly puts her jacket back on and they all head out. Now, here's my question. If Eric doesn't know about witches and warlocks at this point, because they still haven't told him all Mm -hmm. of that yet, why was Piper perfectly fine to be like, Jack's not a warlock? Like, why? Why was that a thing? I don't know. But when Piper was sitting there macking on a guy and Phoebe walks in saying, Sister Witches, how you doing? She gets all bent out of shape. Just saying. Yeah. Continuity, baby. Yeah. Just saying. So we then get a quick shot giving us a look at the Triangle Building before we cut to the girls and Eric walking down the sidewalk. They head up some stairs and we pan up to see the sign for the Bay Ridge Convalescent Hospital yet again. Then inside, we pan through the lobby to see two wheelchairs and a bed just randomly in the room, and we hear a phone ringing. So clearly, the place is fucking empty. Yeah, it's kind of deserted. Where the hell is everyone? And (laughs) and asks Prue if she brought the dagger, and Prue kind of like pats her purse. Yeah, it was kind of fun. Eric then walks up to the desk and sees the receptionist lying on the floor, eyes open, blankly staring at nothing. And then turns to run down the hallway, calling for dad. Yeah. Phoebe calls after him. They all run after him. And then we cut over to Eric's dad's room, where Eric is trying to get his dad up. The girls enter just before Dr. Stone and the nameless collector blink into the room. So clearly, they were busy Making sure that the entire rest of the hospital was incapacitated. Apparently. And couldn't get to dad, despite the fact that they could easily blink in and out of there. Yep. Like, that's easy. Yeah, you know, there there are many things about this episode. Whatever. Yeah. I mean, they're collectors. I get they want to collect shit. Yeah. Well, so Prue uses her power and makes them fling against a wall. They hit the ground and then they blink out with Stone going first. Eric is, of course, confused by what's happening, but Prue says they'll explain later. And she goes out into the hall to get a wheelchair for Dad. And then Stone blinks in behind her, and he taunts her and holds up the dagger and then blinks out. It's like, looking for this? Or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Prue calls into the room that Stone's got the dagger, and back in the room, Stone appears behind Piper and grabs her hair and then puts the dagger near her neck. Phoebe, of course, yells out for her, and then the other collector appears behind Eric and grabs him as Prue comes back into the room with the wheelchair. Phoebe then grabs the vase of flowers that she had, a la convenience, left in the room earlier, and hits Stone over the head. He lets go of Piper and falls to the ground, and then Prue uses her powers and releases Eric from the collector's grip. Stone blinks out and appears next to Eric's dad, holding the dagger, and Prue gets the dagger away from Stone, And as she's throwing it to him, Stone, his henchman, and Eric's dad all disappear. Yep, they blink out of the room, and they leave the dagger to embed itself into the wall and leave Eric very confused. And the the shot of the dagger going into the wall was a really good reverse shot of, I guess, they had it tied to a fishing line and pulled it out of the wall. Yeah. It looked really cool. Yes, And it was clear that the, the angle at which they were pulling it was not the angle it went in, so it kind of, like, turned which made, yeah. which made it go in as though it, like, was thrown and then at the last second twisted to the side and went into the wall. Yeah. See, the angle of the dagger would only actually work if Prue had been standing by the window in the room instead of the doorway. Yep. Because it should have been either at an angle in the spot where it was 
or it should have been between the corner and the painting on the wall. Because there's no reason for it to be at a 90 degree angle where it was. Yeah. From where she was standing when she threw it. Like, there's literally no reason Mm -hmm. why they couldn't have been like, let's put it next to the painting so it looks like from the doorway she threw it and it actually landed in the wall properly. Or maybe they could have done a test where Prue actually threw the thing. And see where it landed? Yeah, and see where it hit the wall and then just like, okay, stick it in there. Yeah, but no. No. They did not. Did she throw it? Holding the handle or holding the blade? I think she I'm threw it holding certain, the handle. Yeah, I'm fairly certain she threw Which it holding the handle. Which is not how you throw a knife. Well, we're not even going to get into that. That's... I mean, the handle has more heft. Yeah. I mean, that's how you measure the tang of a blade. Like, on the, the rapier, the balance point is always supposed to be as close to the handle as possible because the blade is so thin and okay. so sharp. Things you learn from Pirates of the Caribbean. Alrighty then. So we get a quick shot of each of the girls, and then we fade to black to go to commercial. We come back from commercial break to Eric running down the stairs outside the hospital and the girls chasing him. Phoebe is, of course, yelling after him that nothing has changed. So he stops running and he says that everything, everything has, has changed, changed. Because some sort of monster took his dad. Yeah. And he pretty much says it in that tone of voice. He does, kind of. Phoebe, of course, explains that the bad guys are warlocks and that they are witches. And he's like, you're totally fucking nuts. Yeah. And she's like, well, most people think that the Akashic records are a myth, but you know they aren't. So you, you gotta yeah. accept that witches and warlocks are Yeah, also like, a you thing. should totally be able to, to get this down. Like, your mind is a little expanded. You got room, dude. Mm hmm. So, of course, there's a bit of chat about warlocks probably wanting to trade Eric's dad for Eric's mind and Eric freaking out about them being witches. And Phoebe reminds him that she's still the same girl he met, but now he knows her secret. And she trusts him with it. Yeah. Prue, of course, gives her a look, which she ignores, and asks Eric to trust her in return. But he decides to go a different route and walks off. Yeah. Phoebe tells Piper and Prue to go back to the house and she'll get Eric. And she runs off, leaving Piper and Prue to wonder why they should protect him, because he's apparently pissing Piper off. Uh. And then we cut to the museum that's six hours away, and Eric is getting a fire extinguisher, and Phoebe is wondering what he's doing. They start walking through the museum, and they walk up to the exhibit that we saw at the beginning of the episode, the Mapstone. Eric does some poetic waxing about Mm -hmm. the power of the Akashic Records, and then gets ready to break the glass. Phoebe stops him, and he's like, no, if no one else has the knowledge of the Akashic Records then no one will be able to get it. And if anyone has the knowledge, there will effectively be no free will. Yeah. The, Phoebe's like, oh, dude, you're right. And like, then Eric yeah, okay. smashes the glass cabinet with the fire extinguisher. Some lovely plate glass. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was plate glass at that point. It didn't look fake. Yeah, it looked like it was plate glass. And then, of course, an alarm goes off. He takes out the map stone and throws it on the ground. And half of it, like, smashes into red dust. And half of it is just, like, big big ass chunks yeah there was like two huge chunks uh-huh. but the message is now impossible to translate so Especially there's that full. yeah and everyone at the museum has these great reaction shots of like being horrified yeah and shocked and eric's like no one else will be able to translate that map i'm the only one who knows where it leads like yeah. he didn't fucking write it down in his notebook well no because it's in his head mm-hmm. but he he knows it in his head and that's all that matters And then they run away, and then there's an extra in the background who yells about getting security, and then he runs off. It was kind of funny. Mm. I couldn't tell if it was 80 yard or if he actually yelled that, but either way, it was cute. And there's some great shots of the height difference between Alyssa Milano and Misha. Yeah. He's got such long legs. Yeah. Alyssa's, like, very short compared to his six-foot frame. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We cut to an exterior shot of the manor where Prue and Piper are walking up the stairs to the attic, and we get a bit of a shot, a glimpse, at least, of the hallway beyond these stairs, which I don't know that we've had before. I don't know. Like, we always see them coming up the last bend in the staircase to the attic. We never usually see them on the stairs to the attic, so I think this is a slightly new set piece. Hmm. I think they just added to it, and they're like, finally, we have budget for this. Yeah, I do. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. But they continued, like, the wallpaper that's in the hallway and stuff, so mm. that's nice. It's Cool. They have at least good house continuity. Well, that's nice, at least. Prue and Piper have a bit of a back and forth about their father, and whether or not Prue misses him, and Prue starts looking through the Book of Shadows. Piper continues to push Prue about it, and she's like, well, you know, I missed who Dad should have been and who he never was, but I don't miss him. And Piper's immediately like, I do, but lets it drop. 
Mm-hmm. And Prue's like, oh, here's a spell to take information out of Eric's brain forever. Yay! Piper says that the warlocks would be very upset and mm. kill Eric's dad. But Prue's like, no, Eric is the innocent we're meant to protect. And Piper corrects her and she's like, dude, they're both innocents. But, you know, they may have to choose Eric over his father for the greater good. Mm-hmm. Doorbell rings, Piper checks her watch, and is like, shit, that's Dan! Yeah. And tells Prue to go figure out what to tell Phoebe, and then leaves. Yep. So then we cut to the front door, and Dan is standing there ringing the bell when Piper opens it. He asks if she's ready to go, and then he thinks she's not coming. And she's like, I'm not quite ready. And then Phoebe enters the foyer, and they have a little moment of Phoebe being awkward. And then Piper's like, I I can be ready. I promise I can be ready. And he's like, okay, I have to leave in an hour to get there on time. And she's like, okay. And then she closes the door on him without even saying goodbye. And we get a quick cut of Dan outside the door, thinking that someday he'll make it inside before he walks away. Which is funny because he's been in the house. Like, I don't, that was a line where you're just like, wait, what? That Mm -hmm. doesn't really make sense, but okay, whatever. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure why he was thinking that but whatever we cut back inside and piper is now leaning against the door eric and phoebe are standing nearby and then prue enters and phoebe explains that eric destroyed the map stone and they send eric into the other room to check his messages while piper and prue decide who's going to tell phoebe their plan and we get a quick little cut into the wicker room of eric checking his messages of which he has none and we cut back to the kitchen where the girls have walked. And Phoebe is very much not down for the plan of letting Eric's father die. Yeah, Prue tries to explain that they're, you know, trying to save the world, but Phoebe is annoyed that they think that this is the only way to do it. Phoebe starts leaving, thinking they don't care. And then then... turns around, because she remembers that they can hear her thoughts, and she's like, oh, I I didn't mean that. And And Prue's like, well, do you want to tell him? And she's like, yeah, I'll do that, and walks out. Yeah. So then we cut to the wicker room, where Eric's phone rings and he answers it and recognizes the voice of Dr. Stone. And then we cut to the collectors standing next to a car with Eric's dad in a wheelchair. So they apparently yeah. went back to get a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. Collector number two, the nameless one, mm-hmm. is pulling a needle finger out of Eric's dad's head and there's this funky little like CGI. It kind of looks like lava on the side of his face. Yeah, it was a little weird. Like, that's the effect of what happens. It was like a little shimmery, like, thing. Yeah, shimmery, like, tiny lava volcano on the side of your head. Yeah. And he he pulls it out of Eric's dad's head, and Ben, apparently, is this dude's name. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Eric's dad, anyway. And he's suddenly lucid and speaking, and they let him talk to Eric for a moment on the phone before the, the nameless collector puts his finger back in his head and sucks all the brain out. Yeah. So... Now that we have a name, Ben, mm-hmm. I shall tell you about this actor. His name is Jim Antonio. He was born in 1931 in Oklahoma. Where the wind blows freely down the plains. Indeed. He has been acting since 1961, mostly doing single episodes of shows and TV movies. And his last movie was Catch Me If You Can, ah. the Leonardo DiCaprio from 2002. Yes. And his last TV role was a single episode of Boston Legal in 2007. Not much else to say. Back to the show. So they have Ben talk to Eric for a moment, being all lucid, and then they suck his brain back out. And Stone tells Eric that his dad is gone, but he can have him back if Eric just gives him what he wants. And this was a really nice way to establish that they can... Bring it back. Yeah, they can take out the person's mind And they can put them back. And apparently they can really well distinguish whose minds they took out in order to put it back. Because if they collect, like, Mm -hmm. I gotta wonder what their internal filing system is. Because it's good. (laughs) Yeah. If they can just find, oh yeah, here's the dude I took on this date and this was his name. Like, what's your fucking sorting system? You work with some Dewey Decimal shit? It might be DNA based. That, that could work. I mean, their brains must work a hell of a lot faster in order for it to be DNA based. It could be date based and they just know which order people's brains they sucked out was it could be library of congress style because <laughs> that's a hell of a lot of info and you got to know how to sort it could very well be but we don't know we are never going to find out i, I doubt it's as simple as alphabet because mm. i mean you get over 100 contacts in your phone it's tough to find anyone indeed even with the name because sometimes you forget oh did i sort it by last name did i sort it by first name like yeah mm-hmm. anyway <laughs> so Eric asks where he can find them 
He's given a spot, a time, and told to come alone. And then Phoebe comes in just as Eric is hanging up, and it has taken her way longer to get to the wicker room from the kitchen than it should have. It's not that big a house. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously. He should not have been able to have this entire conversation in the time it takes to get from the kitchen to the wicker room. Like, it just, yeah, whatever. She asks if he had any messages. He says no. And then he takes her hands and thanks her for helping him and asks if she's sure she's not an angel. She says, I'm no angel, but I could probably introduce you to one. Yeah. He then puts his hands on her face and tells her that her father would be proud of her. And then she puts a finger to his lips. Like, it looks like she was trying to stop him from kissing her. Even though just a second before he wasn't leaning in toward her. So I wonder if there was like a deleted scene or something. Who knows? I don't know. But he's doing that classic thing of like someone who knows they're going to die trying to make amends. Yeah, kind of. Like close up loose ends. Yeah. Because it's a very dynamic shift from his attitude of just a few minutes previous. And she's like, dude, I need to talk to you about your dad. And, and he he's asks like, could for, I have another cup of tea first? Yeah, he asks for more tea. And she's like, sure, I'll go get it. And she heads toward the kitchen. He starts heading toward the door. At which point, Prue and Piper walk in and ask where he's going. And he passes them and says, oh, I'm just going to get some air. And then thinks the location that Stone gave him. Mm-hmm. And, and he leaves. leaves. And instead of stopping him, freezing him, whatever the fuck, Prue calls out for Phoebe as she's just like exasperatedly gesturing and Eric. Yeah. Phoebe comes running back in, holding boxes of tea bags, which was kind of funny. And she's like, where's he going? And they tell her what he was thinking, and they all head to the door, and we go to commercial break, because why wouldn't we? Yeah. Is when, this the last commercial break? I think it might be. Cool. Yeah. And when we come back from this commercial break, we get a shot of the Oakland Bay Bridge in oh the background. Oh my god. Yep. It's Enough <laughs> with this fucking bridge. What are you, Ted Mosby? Oh, Jesus. That's... Goddamn obsessed with architecture. Deep cuts. Okay. We, we get a shot at the Oakland Bay Bridge in the background of two trees on the side of a street. I know that we've had this shot before. I can't remember what episode it was in, but I know we've had this shot before. So maybe it's the editor who's got the heart on for that bridge. Possibly. Fucking editor. And then we see Piper's green SUV come driving down the road, and then it turns into a makeshift parking spot. And the girls get out of the car and they start walking over the brown grass. And this is an area of whatever park they're at that we get to see a lot in this series. Mm -hmm. Because apparently it's really easy to get to and it doesn't cost a whole lot to film there. Yeah. So they're trying to figure out where to go and how to vanquish the warlocks that, you know, have no vanquish ability, whatever. The vanquish ability. Yeah. And Um, is that a letter grade? (laughs) Blue. Could, could you stop shivering and licking me here? You know, that would be a filing system. Filing your baddies by vanquishability. Like, I wonder how you rate that. I don't know. Is it, like, on Chopped, how they rate based on taste and presentation and creativity? Possibly. It'd be yeah. interesting. It would be interesting. So, they're trying to figure out how to vanquish the warlocks. There's more talk of fathers and happy families. And they figure that they should split up to find Eric and the warlocks, so they all walk off in different directions. And we follow Prue for a moment, and then Phoebe for a moment, and then Piper for a moment, and none of them see anything but grass and trees. And then we cut back to Prue, and she's just walking along, and then a peacock makes a noise and runs past her. I'm not sure that that's the noise peacocks make. I'm not sure either, but it scared her, and she screams and puts her fists up. And, like, as soon as she realizes that it's a peacock, she calms herself down, flips her hair out of her face, and she goes back to walking. And then we cut over to Eric... And he sees the collectors with his dad, and he starts running toward them. And Stone tells him to stop and says that he can either restore Ben or he can kill him. And Eric tells Stone to restore Ben or he's not going to get what he wants. Stone, of course, says that Eric can't bargain. And then Eric shows off the gun and says that he can. The nameless collector reminds Eric that guns do nothing to them. (laughs) But Eric holds the gun up to his own chin and says that if they don't bring his dad back, he's going to kill himself and then they won't get what they want. The collector then puts his little needle finger into Ben's head and restores him. And Eric starts walking towards his dad, who is obviously confused. And then Stone blinks and reappears behind Eric. And he grabs him and sticks his needle finger into Eric's head. And that's the picture that they have on the wiki. Or on the wikia. Yeah. And Phoebe, of course comes up and sees them and she runs up to stone and kicks him and he falls to the ground and then the other collector the nameless one walks up behind her 
and sticks his little needle finger into her head. And then Prue shows up and finds them and she uses her power and he goes flying and hits the ground. And then she runs over to Phoebe and then Piper shows up. So I love how they went in three different directions and they all wound up in the same place. Right, Blue? They always do that. Yep. And then Dr. Stone... It's almost like a metaphor. (laughs) And then Stone disappears and the other collector stands up with his little needle finger out. Piper then yells to Prue to watch out and the nameless collector taunts them out loud before thinking about keeping them busy so that they can get surprised by Stone. And Prue and Piper have a quick little telepathy moment where they decide to let Nameless think that his decoy is working. And then when Stone appears behind Prue with his little needle finger out, Piper freezes them both. And Prue uses her power to move them closer together. So So they're they're, sucking each other's brains. Yeah, so their little finger needles are, are at each other's heads. Piper unfreezes them and their fingers go into each other's heads. And then they start sucking down each other's brains, which makes them apparently implode. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's so, this great effect of, like, their their heads kind of, like, squishing. They CGI squish them. Yeah. They um, literally imploded. Deflate, kind of. Yeah, they literally imploded. Mm-hmm. So I believe this is the first time that we have seen two warlocks vanquish each other. Pretty much. I mean, Rex and Hannah, like, Hannah technically killed Rex and then got sucked into hell or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. But that's not technically vanquishing each other. Yeah. But it's definitely not the first time that the girls have sort of manipulated warlocks to be attacking each other yeah so they implode they go they go bye-bye and And then prue's like oh they shouldn't have given us the finger (laughs) and piper quips you read my mind which was kind of funny and then phoebe wakes up and prue and piper walk over to her and she's okay but has no idea why they're in the park and then his dad Start also waking up, and Phoebe doesn't recognize them. Mm-hmm. And Piper's like, well, what is the last thing you remember? And she thinks about it for a moment before and saying, oh, the Halloween party. And Piper kind of laughs and tucks Phoebe's hair behind her ear, and she's like, sweetie, that was three weeks ago. Yeah, which is right around the time when she started working at the convalescent hospital. Mm-hmm. And they help her up, and then Prue goes over and helps Eric up, and he is also confused as to why they're in the park. Piper asks if he recognizes Phoebe, and he says no, but then he seems to remember her being at the hospital, like randomly seeing her. And then Prue helps Ben up, and he is covered in leaves. So many leaves. So many leaves. And then he and Eric... wouldn't leave him alone. Yeah. And then he and Eric have a lovely reunion, even though they have no idea what's going on. But, you know, I guess his dad had been there for six weeks, so the fact that he doesn't remember the last, like, two weeks or whatever doesn't phase him. Yeah, we don't really know how long dad doesn't remember. And no, how I'm long talking Eric. Eric. Oh, yeah. Like, he remembers that his dad has been in the hospital, and he remembers Phoebe, because he, he looks at, least, at her and he's like, oh. I, yeah, like, he vaguely remembers from her. from the hospital? Yeah, he vaguely remembers her. And Phoebe's like, did we do something good? And Prue tells her that she did something incredible. And then Eric and his dad hug, and Phoebe puts her arm around Prue, who leans into her shoulder. It was a cute, sweet moment. Mm -hmm. It was very nice. And then we fade out and come back into an exterior shot of the manor. So this is later that day. Mm. Prue and Piper are running down the stairs. Prue is now wearing black pants and a purple spaghetti strap crop top with a stripe detail and white trim. Mm -hmm. Piper is in black pants and a blue hoodie with horizontal black and white stripes over the torso and the bust. And she's carrying a big green duffel bag and her coat. And they're both very excited about the fact that the hearing spell has now worn off. Or did they reverse it? It doesn't really matter. The dialogue they're... led me to believe that they had reversed it. Like Whatever. They're both very excited to know that the hearing thought spell is, is no longer yeah. there. And then they walk into the foyer and Piper puts on her coat and they both agree that people shouldn't be able to hear other people's thoughts because it just gets dangerous. The door opens and Phoebe walks in with a bunch of flowers. She's still in the same outfit. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, those are fucking gorgeous. Yeah, that's how we know that this is still the same day, even though it's a logical thing, I guess, that it should be the same day since the whole Piper Dan leaving that day thing. Mm -hmm. Though I can, I can honestly say I don't understand how this all is supposed to have taken place in less than an hour. Yeah. Just saying. But so Prue says that the flowers are gorgeous. And Phoebe's like, they're for you. But then she also says that there's no card. So I'm not sure how she knows that they're for Prue. I feel like those flowers would have been delivered. So maybe Phoebe was outside. 
Well, she and said the florist left them on the porch. Oh, okay. And there's no card. So this huh. is why I say, how did she know they're for Prue? Don't know. Yeah, that's that's baffling. Yeah. So she hands them to Prue, and then we hear a phone ring inside the flowers, and Prue kind of searches through. She finds a little flip phone in the flowers, and she puts it to her ear. She doesn't do anything to it. She just picks up and puts it to her ear, says hello, and starts walking through the living room. And then the phone rings again. So <laughs> so she didn't actually answer it. Do you remember when it was hard to figure out how to answer a phone? Vaguely. Like, vaguely. I just think that's hilarious. Lovely thoughts of brand new technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Piper looks out the open front door and sees that Dan is backing out his driveway, yeah. leaving without her. She's like, and oh she my turns, God, he's leaving without me. She turns me. around to Phoebe and she's like, oh my God, he's leaving without me. And Phoebe's like, honey, freeze, freeze him. him. Yeah. And, and she's like, oh yeah, I can do that. Yeah, it's like she forgot that she had that ability, and it was just very funny. So she kind of, like, leans out the door, freezes him in his car as he's backing up, and then she starts to come back into the house, and was like, I gotta go, and, like, she leaves again. It was just this little moment of, like, weird adorableness. It was great. So she leaves, she closes the door behind her, and Phoebe calls her power such a nifty little power, mm -hmm. which is so true, because I think that would be the power that I would want. Yeah. If if I could have one of their powers, the power to freeze stuff would be the power I would want. Because it would be like, oh, I need to freeze so that I can do the thing I need to do and then go back to life. Mm -hmm. So Phoebe but, walks into the living room. And Prue is still trying to answer the phone, but she's not doing a very good job of it. Yeah. Phoebe then, kind of like sneaks into the same chair as Prue because it's really wide and they can both fit their skinny little butts in it. Yeah, and she, she gives her the... Oh, honey. And then she takes the phone from her and flips it open. And Prue laughs because it's like, oh, that's how you use this. And then she says hello into the phone. And then Phoebe, like, puts her feet up and leans against, like, leans into Prue and leans against to try and hear the phone. Mm -hmm. And on the line is Jack. And he's been calling every 20 minutes for an hour. Which means that, that flowers with the phone in it have been there since just after they left. Yes. Which... Which I yeah. guess is sort of a good continuity thing. Like, it doesn't make sense that they could have been there and back and covered everything in an hour. But it's apparently been an hour since those flowers were left there, so whatever. Yeah. And they, there's a little bit of boring conversation before Phoebe kind of starts making noises into the phone. Yeah, and she's like making like the, like, I don't know if you ever did that when, like, I'm going through a tunnel. <laughs> yeah. You know, like those yeah. noises. Prue so, pr pretends that they're getting really bad reception. And then we and get here's here's my cute favorite scene. cute scene from this season. Yeah. Jack says that he wants to apologize and asks to take her to dinner. And Phoebe shakes her head, so Prue's like, I don't think so. So Jack asks to buy her a drink. Phoebe shakes her head and Prue's like, I don't think so. And then Jack asks to get his phone back. And then Prue and Phoebe look at each other. Phoebe shakes her head and Prue's like, I don't think so. And then hangs up on him. Yeah. And then we hear a dial tone, which isn't a thing that should have happened. Because Did we they're... hear it on his end? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because there's no dial tones on cell phones, and there never have been. So it's a total TV thing yeah. that you get a dial tone when someone hangs up on a cell phone. It's a thing, whatever. But so then they both start laughing, and Phoebe takes the phone and just starts dialing. And Prue's like, what are you doing? And Phoebe's like, I'm calling Tokyo. Konnichiwa! Which is good afternoon in Japanese, Yeah, in case you were wondering. And then we get a lovely shot, the exterior of the Bay Ridge Convalescent Hospital, yet again. Phoebe is now back in her pink scrubs, but this time the jacket is open, and we can see that underneath it, she is wearing blue pants and a shirt that has a geographic print in shades of, like, blues and purples and pinks. Mm -hmm. It was kind of cute. And she's pushing a cart with flowers on it, and then she puts some newspapers onto a table as Eric enters the room. He is wearing tan pants and a white t-shirt under a black sweater with, like, an orange line pattern on the bust that extends to the arms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He says that he is looking for a Dr. Swinsley to sign some insurance papers. And Phoebe's like, oh, he just took Mrs. Brune, who we assume is the lady who lives in that room, mm -hmm. to the sunroom. And Eric's like, thanks. And then introduces himself. And he's like, oh, yeah, I saw you in the park. Yeah. So she asks after his father... And he's like, oh, yeah, he's almost back to his old self. And then we get a mirror of the earlier scene where he calls her an angel. She says that she's not one, but could probably introduce him to one. And they smile, and we hear a little sound of chimes. For, like, deja vu. Mm -hmm. mostly, then, mostly on Phoebe's end, because she gets the confused look. Yeah. And then he starts to leave, but he stops himself because he realizes that he has no idea where the sunroom is. Phoebe says that it's complicated and jokingly offers to draw him a map. 
And then they look at each other as though the word map rings a bell. And then she walks out the door and he follows behind her. Without and... explaining, like, I'll just show you. Yeah. And then we go to the end credits. Mm-hmm. And that's it. That's it. That is the end of the episode. It was a cute episode. It was a cute way to end it. Mm -hmm. But again, we never see him again. Yeah, that makes me sad. Because yeah. Misha. I know. But honestly, he, he needed to get a lot better at acting. Yeah. And he has. I love him, and he is very good now. Indeed. Indubitably. Indubitably, my good sir. Mm -hmm. So that's that episode done. So we are on to our ratings portion of the evening. Have you figured out a rating for yourself? Yep. Okay. Would you like to go first or would you like me? Sure. I'm going to give this one 8 out of 10 demonic filing systems. <laughs> nice. I'm saying demonic because it could apply to things other than warlocks. Indeed. Plus warlockic? Warlockian? Yeah. Warlockian sounds weird. It makes me think of Sherlock. Yeah, no. Not so much. That's or, right. or a Sherlock alternate universe fic that's set during wartime. Warlockian. Wow. All right. I am giving it a 7 out of 10 self-vanquishing warlocks. Mm -hmm. Because why not, right? Mm -hmm. And since there's not a whole lot more to say about our ratings, because there just isn't, we go on to our outfits. Did you have a, a special outfit that you liked in this episode? I really like Phoebe's scrubs. Yeah? Yeah. The first with, where, you, where it was just the scrubs or the second with the outfit underneath being seen? Just the scrubs. Interesting. They were cute. And pink. Yeah, see, I'm not and, a and pink person. And I, I know she's not a candy striper, but it just made me think of candy stripers. Hmm. See, for me, I liked all of the outfits that they were wearing for, like, most of the episode. Though, I might like Piper's final outfit a little bit more than her purple outfit. Just a titch. Mm-hmm. Just the tiniest bit. But that's it. There is no more. We be done. So now we are on to social media time. Ah! Yeah. So, as per always, you can find us on charmchats.com. You can email us at charmchats at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter and Tumblr at charmchatspod. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Patreon and Pinterest at charmchats. Not LinkedIn, though. We're not on LinkedIn. We will never be on LinkedIn. No. No. But that's us done for another week. Yes, indeedy. Well, for another episode. Mm-hmm. So it's done for another episode. And Blue definitely needs to go pee. All right. He's shivering and staring at me. Like, that's what's up with him. Indeed. So, until next time. Sleep tight. And don't let the warlocks bite. Or suck your brain out through a straw needle thing. Finger needle. <laughs> Bye! Bye! Some potions to brew, so we'll see where it's at. It's week with Kendra and Kat. <laughs>